death. Now this isn't a fun topic, but it's something that we really need to talk about. Coronavirus has led to a huge number of deaths around the world, and the numbers are still going up. The problem is that when we talk about huge numbers and show graphs of deaths going up, it's easy to lose perspective of what's really happening. When we're just looking at bars and zeros, you can easily forget the humanity of what's happening and the lives that are being lost. So we thought it was important to take a look at the reality of the coronavirus and consider from a medical perspective how the virus actually kills people. Understanding the reality of the virus helps to limit fear and let us have some real understanding of what's happening. So let's have a real conversation about the virus and how it kills people. Oh, and if you think you know someone who would benefit from this information, please share the video. Also, you subscribing, liking and commenting helps out the channel and this video. The first stage of the process is obviously the infection. Coronavirus spreads from person to person through infected droplets. These droplets are most commonly expelled into the air in the form of a cough, sneeze or simply exhalation. All of these methods of transmission put infected droplets into the air and the virus spreads to you when those droplets enter your system. This can happen by you simply breathing them in or transmission via surfaces. Once the virus enters your system, you begin to enter the incubation stage. It's at this point that the coronavirus begins to hijack the cells in your body, turning them into coronavirus replicating machines. Typically, the virus first infects the lining of your throat and lungs, with the infected cells producing more viruses, which go on to infect more cells. During this incubation stage, while your body is rapidly producing the virus, you won't yet know you're sick. That's because the incubation stage is actually defined as the period between the time of infection and when you start showing symptoms. This period can last anywhere between 2 and 14 days, but in the average case, symptoms begin to emerge after about 5 days. So when you do start showing symptoms, you exit the incubation stage and start to enter the next phase of the virus, or at least some people do. You might have heard talk about asymptomatic carriers of the coronavirus, those who have the virus but don't show any symptoms. These are the people who never progress beyond the incubation stage, with their body fighting off the virus before any symptoms have a chance to emerge. But this doesn't mean that these people can just relax and go to the beach for a barbecue. That's because you are infectious before any symptoms show, meaning that these asymptomatic carriers of the virus can still spread the disease to others, others who might not be able to fight off the disease as easily as them. And this is why self-isolating is super important, and why it's vital to take the process seriously even if you have no symptoms, and even if you believe that you're healthy enough to fight off the virus. You may still be infected, and you could still pass the virus on to others. If you're wondering how many people are asymptomatic and never progress on to the next phase, then I'm afraid I have a very unsatisfying answer for you, because we don't really know. As I'm sure you're fully aware, COVID-19 is a brand new strain of the coronavirus, so at this stage we still don't know all that much about it. And that's why when you look at articles and studies about the proportion of asymptomatic people, you'll get very mixed results. This was really highlighted by the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, who completed a meta-analysis of COVID-19 research and found that between 5 and 80% of people are asymptomatic. The analysis describes this as the fog of the pandemic, where one question gets a whole bunch of different answers, depending on who you ask, because we just don't know that much about the virus yet. So, in some proportion of cases, the patient begins to develop symptoms, generally about five days after they were infected. There are essentially three levels of the disease that people can begin experiencing at this point. The most common is just a mild disease, with some experiencing a severe disease and even fewer suffering from a critical condition. Let's start with the most common, the mild case. About 80% of those who show symptoms will only have the most mild symptoms. These symptoms can typically include a dry cough and a fever, although various aches, headaches and sore throats are also possible. The dry cough can be explained by the infection in the throat and lungs I mentioned earlier, with the body reacting to these cells becoming infected. 
with some people coughing up sputum towards the end of the infection, with mucus containing the dead lung cells that the virus has killed. The other symptoms, like a fever, are the result of the body's immune system fighting off the infection, and as such, the symptoms begin to subside once the patient rests and the immune system has the chance to defeat the infection. This means that those with mild symptoms typically only need to rest, drink plenty of fluids, and take paracetamol if necessary. This phase typically lasts about a week, at which point the body should have defeated the virus, the immune system stops releasing cytokines, and the symptoms subside, allowing for a full recovery. However, this isn't the reality for everybody, with some suffering from more severe symptoms. Data out of China suggests that about 14% of those infected end up with these severe symptoms. When this more severe version of the virus develops, it's the result of the immune system's response to the virus. That's because these systems begin to emerge when the immune system overreacts to the infection, with the chemical signals it sends to the rest of the body resulting in inflammation and damage. The immune system is attempting to signal the infection to the rest of the body, but by overreacting, the immune system is failing to strike the right balance, and can cause excess inflammation. The inflammation is commonly centred around the lungs, a condition that's more often known as pneumonia. This inflammation causes fluid to begin accumulating in the lungs, making breathing more difficult, as well as reducing blood oxygen levels. It's because of this that you hear so much about people being put on ventilators, as this machinery is put in place to assist with the patient's breathing and keep them alive. Some patients also end up with critical symptoms, currently around 6%. When a patient reaches this phase, they're normally suffering from a number of issues, with the immune system really spiralling out of control while trying to fight off the virus. And by this point, breathing is far from the only issue. Dr. Otto Yang, an expert in infectious disease from UCLA, commented on this, saying it's no longer limited to the lungs. There's this inflammation that's all throughout the whole body now. This can often lead to kidney issues, with the virus hijacking cells in the kidney as well as the lungs. Considering the kidney's vital role in filtering your blood, compromised kidneys can lead to a buildup of waste in the body. But by this point in the infection, the lungs and the kidneys are often only the start of the issues, with the potential for a chain reaction throughout the whole body as the immune system tries desperately to fight off the disease, potentially leading to septic shock. Septic shock causes the body's blood pressure to drop significantly, at which point other organs can stop functioning properly, or just fail entirely. As the immune system fails to respond to the virus, the fight will move across the whole body, potentially leading to multi-organ failure. This can still be treated, with the apparatus being upgraded from a standard ventilator to extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This is when tubes are used to remove blood from the body before oxygenating it and returning it to the body, essentially working as an artificial lung. This is highly invasive, and it's not always possible depending on a variety of factors. Even if the ECMO process is used, there's no guarantee that it will be successful, and often, as other organs begin to fail or septic shock hits in, this artificial lung is no longer sufficient to keep the body operating. As you probably gathered, this is the point at which patients begin to die. Not everyone reaches the later and more advanced stages before they pass away, with many dying simply because they're unable to breathe. Ventilators are supposed to assist with breathing, but even when they're in place, it doesn't guarantee survival, with some patients' lungs still failing. Despite all of the horrible terms and processes we've discussed in this video, it's worth knowing that for most patients, this isn't incredibly uncomfortable or distressing. As people's lungs begin to fail, and the oxygen level in their blood begins to fall, they will often begin struggling to stay awake, and find their energy slipping away until they become unconscious. This means that very often when someone dies from the coronavirus, it's simply a process of them falling unconscious as their oxygen supply depletes, before they slip away and their lungs and heart fail. This death isn't the desperate gasping for breath that you might have imagined. Instead, it's a slower, more peaceful process that very often the patient is barely aware of. So while this process might be horrible, and clearly no one likes talking about death, let alone being faced with it, hopefully knowing a little more helps you understand the situation better. 
Across the world, families often aren't allowed to be around their loved ones for their final days in order to prevent the virus's further spread. And not being around your family members when they're in hospital is obviously distressing, whether they die or not. But hopefully, it's some comfort to understand how the process works and know that from their perspective, if the moment does come, they're probably not even aware of it happening. If you do have any questions, drop them in the comments below. And if you know anyone you think might benefit from this video, please share it with them. You can also subscribe to the channel for more updates as the coronavirus crisis continues. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.